Everybody, this is going to be a great day. I don't want to take up too much time. Uh, as we begin our STEM Festival for Carroll Community College in conjunction with the statewide effort, we have some great things going on for you today and an amazing panel uh, to talk about STEM careers. Let me ask, without further ado, Mr. Brian Shoemaker from Carroll County Public Schools, the STEM coordinator and moder moderator of today's event, to come to the podium. Brian? Thank you, Dr. Ball. It's a pleasure to be here partnering with Carroll Community College for this exciting event today. Um, Dr. Ball did mention this is the Maryland STEM Festival. I thought it might, we might be the first one in the state of the nearly 300 that will take place over the course of the next nine days. We're actually second. Someone started at nine today. But thank you for being here early. And for those of us watching on the streaming channels, welcome as well. Uh, we live in dynamic times, and I hope the participants here today will benefit from the realization that many of the topics we discussed today could influence the, your career path or college choices that you're making or about to make. For our, um, for our participants that are watching remotely, we will be using an online tool at the end of this to participate Q&A, so we'll have some people live uh, doing some questions, and we'll hopefully get some participation from, again, those watching. I want to let our presenters know that, the, um, well, Dr. Ball already mentioned that we do have the balcony full. He stole my thunder there. Without further ado, our first speaker did her undergraduate work in medical microbiology and received her PhD in biomedical sciences. She is a senior scientist in the laboratory of Dr. Sina Bavari in the Molecular Translational Science Division of the U.S. Army Research Institute of Infectious Disease, also known as USAMRID. She has over 15 years of experience in mass spectrometry and is the lead scientist for proteomic studies at USAMRID. She has over 50 peer-reviewed publications in microbiology, prostate cancer, and protein expression, tissue imaging, and clinical proteomics. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Lisa Casares. Thank you for that awesome welcome, and I'm so glad to be on your beautiful campus this morning. But today, what I will talk to you about is a discovery journey that I have made from the field of cancer research to the field of infectious disease. And I'm going to talk to you about some very interesting tools that we're using, both in diagnostics and in biomarker discovery, to try and help both treat and diagnose diseases and develop new drugs. So um, I have to put this disclaimer up. Uh, it just says that we are using animals in a proper way for this research, as you can see. But um, let me go back to a little bit of basics for you guys. So in bio Biology 101, you know that we have a genetic code. We, that genetic code is then transcribed into RNA, which is then translated into proteins. And if you have been keeping up with some literature, you know that we have this whole omics nomenclature now. So genomics is the study of DNA. Transcriptomics is the study of RNA. Proteomics is the study of proteins, and that's what I do. So um, metabolomics, which is right below proteomics, is the study of metabolites. And as you see, we go from the blueprint, which is DNA, to the RNA, which is sort of taking that blueprint into a functional entity, followed by the protein, which is the workhorse of the cell. And actually, proteins in your body do a lot of things, but they can also do a lot of bad things in disease. So what can we do with proteomics? I have a little guy here in the middle showing, uh, you know, from his body what kind of information can we get. Well, I am in a discovery research kind of mechanism, and I am looking for molecular markers of diagnosis, studying drugs that we have in process and their mechanism of toxicity, and also studying new drug targets. So we have a lot of drugs out there to treat infectious disease, but we also have a lot of infectious diseases that we haven't been able to really find good therapeutics for. So how are we going to do this? And how are we going to do it with the tools that I'm talking about, which is mass spectrometry? So mass spectrometry is really a very fancy technical way to weigh things, to measure their mass. And for proteins, we can do that quite easily in a mass spectrometer. And we can get information not only about the mass or the weight of these proteins, but about the sequence and the functionality of these proteins. And the way that we do look for proteins is, can we see a change in the body in the proteins that are present when that organism is diseased, right? 
And by studying that mechanism of disease, can we exploit those proteins to be now diagnostic markers? So I show again a human here, but what you have to realize at the US Army laboratory where I work, we have many animal models to study these very uh, pathogenic infectious diseases out of necessity. We of course cannot use human subjects. So we use mice, we use small primates to look at the uh, response to the disease and try to profile it. And we do that by looking at the blood components. We can also look at tissue. And then we look to see, hey, what has changed there? And can we exploit that for our purposes? So um, last year, I'm sure you guys didn't escape seeing the, um, uh, the coverage of the Ebola outbreak that was happening in West Africa. And this is a little uh, graphic that I took from the Huffington Post to show you that Ebola can have a long incubation period, and this, of course, depends on the exposure. But then after the incuba incubation period is over, it takes between one to three days for sim symptoms to develop. And during the outbreak, everyone was concerned, well, how can we tell if someone's been infected? How can we tell if they have traveled? And at that time, the only symptom that was sort of reliable was a fever. Okay? We have a little bit better diagnostics now, but again, the level of virus in the blood needs to be pretty high in order to get that positive um, test done. So we still don't have a really good pre-symptomatic way to see if somebody has the Ebola disease or Ebola virus. So what we're trying to do by looking at all the way proteins changes in a host that's been infected, can we use that as a diagnostic? So this is basically the experimental design that we're using. We start with a, a, in containment, collecting those samples. And of course, all of the work that's done on Ebola, the Ebola virus at USAMRIT is done at biosafety level four containment. And this means that the scientists are actually in these little spacesuits with a dedicated air supply. And they manipulate the samples in containment. Then we treat those samples with a chemical that is going to completely inactivate the virus, and then the samples can be easily removed from containment. They're then treated. Um, in this case, what we're doing is we're digesting all the proteins down to little pieces because the mass spectrometer is really good at measuring smaller pieces rather than larger pieces. And once we've chewed all these proteins, we can then combine samples from multiple time points. So from a single experiment, we would have a day zero, which is a pre-infection sample, and then we would take blood on day one, three, five, seven, and nine, and that way we can see the host response to the disease mounting in the organism. And then in the mass spectrometer down here, what we get is relative quantitation of those proteins or peptides in the animals. So as an example, this is what data would look like. So here's a protein, lip lipopolysaccharide binding protein, and this is the data from one non-human primate showing at the baseline level, we, didn't, we have a fold value of one for this protein, but then during the course of infection, this protein abundance increases tremendously. And one point that I want to make is usually by day seven or eight, um, control animals will succumb to the disease. So this is the end stage here. And th these areas right here, proteins that change between do day two and three, are really what I'm looking for. So we have been doing experimentation like this probably for the past year and a half. And what we've been able to build are these biomarker patterns, if you will, or protein patterns that show the expression of all of these markers over time. And then we can coordinate this for a lot of other diseases. So for instance, I have showing here, the blue lines are Ebola infected animals and the red lines are a bacterially infected animal. So now I'm comparing a bacterial infection to a viral infection and I'm looking for the difference in host response. Well, you can see a lot of things change the same. Maybe the kinetics are a little bit different in the bacterial samples. A lot of proteins look the same. We can also see not only host response proteins, but we can see viral proteins in the blood of these animals. This is showing you an Ebola matrix protein that I can detect by mass spectrometry increasing around day four or five. That's not really gonna help me so, good, so much with pre-symptomatic detection. So that's why I'm backing it up to look at the host response, because your body is seeing this organism before the, it can replicate inside your cells, and that host response is our best chance of seeing it, getting a pre-symptomatic diagnosis. So just um, an example showing you a protein that does have differential expression between the virus, uh, which is shown here, Ebola-infected animals, versus 
bacterial infected animals. And if you can sort of leap ahead a few years to this research, you could surmise that maybe if we have host response proteins that discriminate between a viral infection and a bacterial infection, now we can help translate that sort of research into a very basic test that you could do in a clinic that would tell a doctor right away if you had a bacterial or a viral infection. And this could be quite beneficial because of the over uh, prescription of antibiotics, right? We don't want to give people antibiotics to have a viral disease, and it's biomarkers like this that may actually help us get there. So just to say, you know, hey, we can find some host response proteins that change before virus is detected. We can see differences and changes, and the viral proteins that are detected may not actually allow us to reach our goal of pre-symptomatic detection. So that's my story about biomarker discovery in body fluids from animal study, studies of virus and bacteria. But now I want to step into another realm of tissue. So um, we just installed this behemoth mass spectrometer at USAMRED. It is a Fourier transform ion cyclotron resonance mass spectrometer. Another very fancy way of saying this can weigh molecules down to one part per million. So very high mass accuracy. And what that means is just by the mass accuracy that I get in the mass spectrometer and the elemental formula of a protein or a metabolite, I have identification. So I am now weighing things at such a large scale that I can now get um, identification. And what we're doing with this instrument is we actually put tissue inside it. We cut little sections of slides. And then we can visualize the analytes or the proteins and metabolites that are present there. So how does this work? So you get a sample. Let's say you took a mouse and you took the brain out and you snap froze it and then you section it and you place those tissues on slides. Then we go and we take a uh, matrix, which is another chemical that's needed for the, ion, for the ions to ionize in the mass spectrometer. And then the tissue is actually read with a laser across to generate two-dimensional images. So this is an example of one of those images. So a histological image is, is, is obtained with light microscopy. And you can see by staining where these vessels are located. But in the mass spectrometer, it's an untargeted approach. So I can raster across this entire tissue section and look at individual ions and where they are expressed. And sometimes those ions are mimicking the histological image. Okay? So what can we do with this? Well, what we want to do is we want to see at that pathogen host interface. So if you could imagine if there was a lesion in the brain from a virus or a bacteria, and now I'm looking at these proteins and metabolites in that sample, can I see what has changed at that host pathogen interface? And we're also using a method called heat fixation because as I mentioned before, it's very important to inactivate our virus before we bring it out of biocontainment. And heat fixation is just a way to cook the tissue, if you will, and kill the pathogen. And this is showing you a comparison of a mass spectrum of lipids between a heat-fixed brain and a snap-frozen brain, and then an image mimicking the histology. So here we have brain from heat-fixed and frozen showing the expression of two lipids, which are metabolite molecules, very small, and the expression in different areas of the brain. So what we really want to do with all of this is have a cohort of samples where we can look at that host pathogen interface, determine which molecules are changing during disease, and then design drugs to target those molecules, and that's how we build new therapeutics. So in a nutshell, I hope I've shown you guys that we can take body fluids and tissue, do biomarker discovery some, for some of the very worst diseases that are threatening the world now, and then hope to then develop that data into something useful as a drug. And one thing that I do want to mention for you STEM uh, students that are looking to go into science, we are always looking for good bioinformatic approaches because we can generate so much data very quickly and having that data support is going to be crucial as we move forward with these very high technology platforms for disease discovery. And that was <laughs> my bioinformatics blurb and I think that's it. So thank you for your attention. Thank you, <clears throat> Dr. Kasari's excellent 
Our second speaker is a principal senior scientist at the Advanced Biomedical Computer Center in the Information Systems Program in Frederick, Maryland. His current research includes the structural characterization of macromolecules and nanobiomaterials, and the study of molecular mechanisms involved in retrovirus maturation. He did his postdoctoral studies at the University of Uppsala Biomedical Center and Johns Hopkins Medical Institutions. Prior to joining the National Cancer Institute under, the John, under John Erickson, where he worked on the development of anti-HIV therapies. He has co-authored over 100 peer-reviewed publications and patents. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Raul Cacho. Thank you. Um, this, is, uh, this is great. Uh, thank you, actually, for, for mentioning informatics. Informatics is one of those subjects that uh, is going to be unavoidable, simply unavoidable for all of you. Uh, you're going to use it, you're going to benefit from it, you're going to suffer the consequence of the shortcomings of the technology, so you're going to develop it yourself. Uh, so what I want to do today is uh, give you a sense of how we are actually uh, going through this changing, rapid changing uh, field of informatics in general through a couple of examples that I would like to, uh, to use to initiate a, a conversation with you. So I'm going to use um, the uh, cancer uh, problem as, uh, as a guide for this conversation. Uh, you, you know when you are dealing with a complex disease, the main uh, sections of the conversation, prevention, diagnosis, and treatment, which are common from pretty much any, uh, any disease, and you know that they are linked uh, in a very natural way uh, to prevention to risk factors, diagnosis to symptoms and markers, treatment to drugs, to something that you can actually to ameliorate the condition. And you know that there is a push to get this uh, personalized, to get these treatments, the diagnosis, uh, the notions that we use for prevention um, customized for a patient. Now, this is something that is benefiting uh, from uh, an amazing revolution that happened in biosciences since the human genome, or perhaps a little bit earlier than that. And it's the availability of these sequence spaces. The sequence spaces can be the genome proper, it can be other things, it can be protein sequences and whatnot. But the important thing, the important notion to grasp here is the fact that this space of annotation actually is bidirectional. Let's say that you have in a sequence space, a mutation. That mutation can indicate uh, a risk for a patient uh, or, or, or just an individual, not a patient yet, and, uh, and that can be used for prevention. It can indicate something that is actually uh, not right in a tumor, and, uh, and it can lead to treatment. Eventually, it can give us the opportunity to develop vectors and reinject uh, a, a gene and correct the disease. But it's the same annotation space. In essence, from an informatics point of view, you have one map of the world, and you're traversing this map in different directions or for different reasons, but you have actually one annotator. Furthermore, that annotator encodes a fundamental piece of information, which is that of the proteins that build the cell. These are the machineries of life, and for those of you that are curious, uh, please visit the pages of the uh, Research Collaborative for Structural Biology. It's a wonderful, wonderful place uh, just to get a, a, a sense of what we have accomplished over the last uh, 40 or so years in terms of characterizing some of these uh, machineries. Now, if you have the machineries, and let's focus on a few of them, I will just use for the purpose of example uh, some of the machineries that are present in the bloodstream, fibrin and whatnot. Um, you can imagine that there are, as I said, the possibility if one of these machines got affected by a mutation uh, of making a correction, but there is also the possibility of interfering with them. This is what we have been doing for the most part for many, many years when we developed drugs. Now, there is another revolution in the midst that you have heard about, and it's the use of these new materials called nanomaterials. Uh, these are not drugs e exactly. Uh, what they are is something in between a molecular machinery and a drug. 
they're much larger. The cube to the, on, on the right uh, represents uh, a metal particle, for instance. Uh, it can be something else. And it's in a scale, in, com in, in a comparative scale with, uh, with uh, the machineries that I mentioned before that you have in the bloodstream. Now, the composition of, this mach of these machines, of these materials, is, is varied. It can be pretty much anything that you can imagine. So we are not really constrained by the proteins as, as we were until recently. Now we're expanding our universe. We can try different things. Some of them look like uh, uh, cavities, like, like the liposome, and you can encapsulate uh, drugs. Um, some can be markers, like quantum dots, that actually shine and can be used to detect the site of action or, uh, or, or, or some other condition. You can combine them and you can create these amazing opportunities to have machineries that will indicate where something is happening and maybe respond to an external trigger and exert the function. That's all fine, uh, and, and this is just to emphasize the, uh, the, the gamut of possibilities in the same scale, that little um, square to the left, I will zoom in, is a nanoparticle as well. It's a buckyball. You may have heard about this uh, as well. And this gives you a sense of size and chemical complexity. These things that we are comparing are completely different. As a matter of fact, you can even take some of the materials from the bloodstream, like albumin, and create aggregates of those and create nanoparticles from those materials as well. The challenge now is how do I compare these materials? I have departed from the comfort zone of the gene annotation. There is no sequence space here. These materials do not, are not the result of the expression of a gene. Uh, they are artifacts. So I have no sequence. They are alien materials. Uh, how can I assess risk? How do I know if these materials can be dangerous or not? So I'm going to discuss with you just one approach just to emphasize some of the informatic challenges, and I'm going to do that by looking at some imaging methods. Um, for instance, this is a technique, this is a classical technique. Uh, you take a cell, that's what you have on the image to the left, and, um, and you can expose that cell, these are lymphoblasts, uh, to an insult. It can be a drug, it can be something else. And then you monitor, in dark pink is the uh, uh, nucleus of the cell, what happened to the nucleus. In this case, you have, uh, for instance, in this section, a chunk of the genetic material have left the nuclei. That's bad, real bad. After mitosis, you're supposed to have two nuclei. You don't have to have, you're supposed to have leftovers. Um, that indicates that whatever happened to that cell, whatever that cell was exposed to, was potentially genotoxic. Okay? So we can use this type of test to evaluate some type of risk. But remember, the risk I'm interested in is the risk I don't know, not the risk I know, because I'm working with new materials. So again, I'm halfway through. By the way, uh, to the right are some of my students. There are seven students that were involved on this, on this project. And, uh, and some of the challenges that we have, the image in the middle indicates the presence of a micronuclear that is barely visible uh, because of lack of contrast. So we need to do many things with this. And these are all informatic layers. <laughs> they include improving the quality of the images. We use high dynamic range photography for that, the same that you have in your phones. Uh, we try to build context, so we stitch the images together using new methods. Uh, this is sim so similar to the panoramas that you use in your phone. Um, we need to collect information, and for that you need to build annotators, and, uh, um, and, and eventually you get what you want. You get a catalog, and now you're trying to build some statistics out of that. Uh, now, faint signatures, we can try to improve them. And classify features are a challenge. Now, how do we approach and classify features? We use artificial intelligence. Uh, you may have heard uh, about deep learning or um, uh, Watson, uh, any of these uh, new engines. Essentially, in our case, what these engines will do is um, they will decompose an image into sections of the image, smaller and smaller sections. And then they will try to rebuild the images from the small segments. The actual procedure is rather complex. I don't have time to describe it in detail right now. But uh, the important thing here is to understand that there is a decomposition method 
and then a recomposition method to compare two objects that are essentially dissimilar. Now, at the end of that process, uh, which one? This one. And this is another page that, uh, that I recommend to actually to explore if you're interested in these methods. Um, at the end of that process, what we have built is essentially a classifier. So what you get in here is a set of images. When you process them through the, uh, through the tool, you will get that uh, the first one is bad. I mean, you see a chunk of genetic material that has left the nuclei. Good, the classifier did a good job. Uh, the next one is classified as bad as well. Good, good job. The next one is, uh, it shows no sign of uh, damage, so it's, uh, it's a healthy cell. Uh, the next one also shows a micronuclei is bad. And now I have this one down here annotated as bad. And then you want to ask the machine, what do you mean by bad? What is that you have discovered in there that you're not aware of? Uh, now, to clarify this a little bit, let me introduce seven of nine, uh, our parrot. Uh, she's there every time I arrive home, every day, and sometimes she will scream at us, that's bad. What that means, essentially, is that the dog has done something that he shouldn't have done, right? Now, it seems like she has some level of intelligence. Sometimes, actually, her attitude conveyed that message as well. I mean, you think, wow, she got it, right? Well, I can tell you the, the, the layer of intelligence is rather shallow. Uh, so what she's doing is reporting a condition. But the semantic process in the brain of the bird is not exactly equivalent to ours. Um, if you actually go back to the deep learning process, something similar is happening here. The decomposition of the image internal to the machine is what you're looking at right now. And I challenge you to tell me if the image that you're looking at is actually that of a house, a tree, a car, a bicycle. It doesn't make any sense to us. Because the mode of internal decomposition does not match our mental process. In short, what we have created is an amazing classifier that actually can discover knowledge, can discover information past the superficial level in ways that in many instances are better than humans. But it's not really conceptualizing. It's not telling me what is the origin of the problem. And that's a real challenge. So, um, how do we integrate these tools then with the type of explorations that we're interested in? How do I bring this information back to my scaffolds so I can reduce my risk? The challenge towards the future, and this is the challenge that you will confront pretty much on any discipline uh, with these new tools, is to connect these amazing indexers uh, of artificial intelligence tools back to the physics of the process. In other words, what we are trying to do now is having improved the images, having classified the images, is to find the actual particle in the image using many of the same techniques that you just hear about. And, uh, and when we found them, trying to connect the information, what happened to the cell with the actual properties of the molecule that we have embedded in there. In other words, we're building a new genome of sorts, but this one is based on the properties of the material. It's based on the three-dimensional arrangement of the atoms in the material. Uh, now, as I said, this is something that will affect us all and will affect us in the same manner, no matter what you do. So if you, want, if you go a couple of layers back to the beginning of the presentation, the same exact scenario uh, happens once again. We talk about prevention, diagnosis, treatment. Uh, ideally, you want prevention to be prediction. Uh, you want uh, treatment to be precise and personalized. Now, to get there, you need to treat the patient the way we're treating the nanoparticle, as a unique thing. This is not just a generic. This is actually someone with the specific personal history, exposure, and so forth. The genomic information will come back in, but uh, what you would like to do is to not segment the data. Essentially, what I show you today with the images means one thing and one thing only. We are not reducing the data. Over generations, we have been reducing the data simply because we don't have this type of tools. An image was reduced to a number. Now we are not reducing the image to a number. We are keeping the entire image live, and that's what we call big data. We need to get used to work with implicit models. 
Essentially, what the neural network is producing is that, is an implicit model. And we need to be able to operate on this, on the implicit models using abstraction. So you need tons of math. Whatever you do, if you're interested in science, technology, engineering, do math because the abstraction will actually be fed from the knowledge that you will acquire in there. This is just a glimpse uh, to an ongoing revolution, and again, it's going to affect us all. Uh, so I presume that uh, you're going to have questions. Please feel uh, con uh, free to contact us. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Cashel. Our third speaker is a pediatrician at Frederick Memorial Hospital by day, and as well as the president of the uh, Westminster City Council. He served in the Army Medical Corps for seven years, then moved to Westminster in 1997. He's a Renaissance man and the author of a science fiction novel called Time Bomb, in addition to serving as the chair of the Finance Committee and other duties. For the last three years, he has led the effort to build the Westminster Fiber Network, the first community-wide gigabit fiber network in the entire Mid-Atlantic region. He is here to share the possibilities of how a gigabit network could, will, and should affect our community. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Robert Wack. Good morning. I don't have any uh, PowerPoints. I'm just going to get up here and talk and hopefully uh, get some help from you guys. First, that stuff is cool. That is the coolest. Uh, that just makes my, my geek go wild when I see stuff like that. And I'll be honest with you, I'm a pediatrician. I went to medical school, and I didn't understand about three quarters of that. But I can tell you that is the future. That's the 21st century. That's where you guys need to go, and as well as the other things you're going to hear up here. Um, and that, you know, I am going to talk about the Westminster Fiber Network, but I also want to take the opportunity to just kind of talk to you guys about um, your careers in technology and, and uh, taking risks and that sort of thing, because it all ties together. You know, you don't push the boundaries of human knowledge unless you're willing to take some risks. And so I'm going to take a risk uh, right now, and I'm going to uh, sing a song. I'm going to sing a song from probably one of the greatest movies of the 21st century, and perhaps all time. And hopefully you guys know this song, and because I'm putting myself out here and taking this risk, I need you to jump in and sing with me if you recognize the song. I love technology, not as much as you, you see. Still, I love technology, always and forever. Come on, you guys know this song. So if you don't, I feel sorry for you because this is from an excellent movie. Um, it's about geeks, and we're all geeks here, and it's a, a celebration of, of geekdom. Um, the Dynamite Brothers take a lot of risks in that movie, um, whether it's Kip buying the time machine or uh, Napoleon sticking himself out there with the dance routine. Um, but the point of that is, is that you don't accomplish anything unless you are brave enough to take risks. And that's the way you push the boundaries. That's the way you expand human knowledge. That's the way you have any kind of success in your life. Thomas Edison. You guys know Thomas Edison, right? Please tell me you know Thomas Edison. Uh, Thomas Edison, one of his big quotes was, um, the biggest failures that he ever saw in his career were when people failed at something and then they stopped trying. And that failure, and so the extrapolation of that is that failure is essential to success. Nobody succeeds without failing. And when you fail, what, the way you deal with that is what determines your ultimate success. When you fail and you learn from that failure and you keep trying, you have to keep moving forward or moving. Just, it may not be forward. Maybe you change direction, but you keep moving because when you fail and you stop, that's the worst failure. Um, so Thomas Edison, back at the end of the Civil War, he starts inventing things, right? He invents the telegraph, or he, he, he started improving the telegraph. He invented the telephone, the phonograph, movies. And um, these were all electrical appliances, right? And so and this is where I'm going to tie it into the Westminster Fiber Network. Stay with me. So in the end of the Civil War, the 1870s, 1880s, 1890s, Thomas Edison's inventing all these electrical appliances. 
Well, they need electricity to work, right? There's no electricity. There are no, there's no electrical system. There's no electrical generation systems. So he takes on another project, and he builds one of the first electrical generation and transmission systems in New York City. And he starts building the electrical distribution system. And he started, or he and other people, Westinghouse and a bunch of other people, started the electrification of the United States. And they started doing that strictly because of telephones and electric lights and the telegraph. So three technologies today that are, are seem fairly primitive, but then they were like the cutting edge, and they were the one. These these were the technologies that were driving the creation of this new infrastructure that we take for granted today. It's like, of course, electricity. You turn on a light. Everybody's got electricity. Is there any place in the United States that doesn't have electricity? No. But they didn't have it then, and it, take, it took the creation of this infrastructure to distribute electricity to um, bring that out to every corner of the United States. But when they were doing that, there was no such thing as a fax machine. There was no such thing as a personal computer. There was no such thing as an electric vacuum cleaner. There was no such thing as a dishwasher. All of those inventions and discoveries and innovations all happened after the creation of the infrastructure to deliver electricity, right? So today, what's the, infrastructure, what's the electricity of the 21st century? When all of these things that we've been talking about so far, all those devices in your pockets, all the equipment you use at home, what do they require? Data, tons and tons of data, right? You've been working on a project and you need to upload something or download something and your connection goes down, or your brother is playing Call of Duty and you're jamming up your modem or something. For some reason, you can't get the data you need. What is that like? It's like suffocating, right? Well, it is suffocating. The data is the oxygen of the 21st century. And for the growth of our economy and for you guys to do what you need to do as the next generation of technology leaders, you need data. You're going to be moving tons and tons of data, and you need to be able to do that easily, invisibly, transparently. Just like when you turn on a light switch and that electricity comes pouring out of that switch, you don't know where it comes from. You don't know how it happens. You just need electricity. Well, you need the same thing for your data. So to do that, we need to build, in this country, the same kind of infrastructure for moving data that we do for moving electricity. And that's what we're doing in the city of Westminster. We are building a fiber optic network that's going to touch every home and business in the city, as well as, hopefully, eventually outside the city. And we're going to begin a process that we are actually, in the United States, well behind on, that we're going to be begin building this 21st century data infrastructure so that, again, you guys, when you're doing your innovations and you're doing your research and all this cool informatics stuff, you're going to be moving gigabytes, terabytes of data at just a push of a button, two seconds go by, okay, I'm on to the next task. Because right now you can't do that, and we're not going to move ahead until you're able to do that, and that's what we're doing in the city of Westminster. So we started this project about three years ago. Um, it's obviously very complicated, very expensive, um, and we have just finished the first phase of the construction, and we're doing the engineering for the second phase, and uh, for those of you who live around here, we've finished out at the airport and over down and by the Kara Lutheran Village area. And then next year, that whole west side, west of 31, um, will be connected or will have the opportunity to be connected if people want it. And, um, the, and it's going to provide gigabit service at prices that are cheaper than what some of you are paying now. And so a gigabit is is a thousand megabits and uh, you can do a lot with a gigabit. Uh, you can download a movie in a couple seconds, you can do interesting things with virtual reality, interesting things with cloud services, and things that you guys are going to invent because we don't know what they are. Just like when Thomas Edison was stringing the electric wires and electrifying, electri electrifying the country, they didn't have fax machines or personal computers. So, so we're doing this so that you all as the technology leaders of the future are going to have that basic infrastructure and that unlimited oxygen supply to take our broadband applications and all these other innovations that you're going to work on to the next level. So that's all I've got. Thank you for whoever it was that pitched in on the Napoleon Dynamite song. I appreciate it. And um, 
be available for questions at the end. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wack. I sang, but they cut my mic. Um, our fourth speaker is a senior researcher at the Johns Hopkins University Applied Physics Laboratory. He received his BS and MS degrees in electrical engineering from Penn State University. His background includes power systems, power electronics, and instrumentation control, system design and development for naval applications, as well as commercial electric utilities. Presently, he is researching methods to improve the cybersecurity of the U.S. critical infrastructure control systems with an emphasis on energy and healthcare sectors. He is a licensed professional engineer in the Maryland and the Maryland author of six U.S. patents. He has volunteered at CCPS schools to model engineering for middle school students and, like others, has done some amazing things that he won't be able to talk about due to security reasons today. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Joe Mario. Thank you very much. Um, I feel like Dr. Wack, you really set the bar high here. I have no musical entertainment to provide you today. I apologize. Um, so good morning, everyone. I'm going to begin my presentation by asking you to use your imagination. I want you to imagine using your STEM education for good. I mean something really good, like protecting people and the things they care about. Imagine that you are a cybersecurity researcher working for the government, and you and your team have been tasked with designing a cybersecurity system to protect the nation's next generation air traffic control system. Working with government agencies and private industry, your team develops a multi-layer defense for all the connected systems. Shortly after the installation of your team's solution, a terrorist organization begins a cyber attack on the air control system networks. But thanks to your efforts, the system is re resistant to the attack protecting the lives of thousands of airline passengers. Or, imagine that you work for a large financial institution's IT sector. Criminals have launched a cyber attack on the bank in an attempt to steal people's personal information and to um, uh, steal people's uh, funds from their accounts. Fortunately, you happen to be working on the cyber watch floor that evening and you notice the unusual network activity you are able to stay one step ahead of the criminals as they progress through the system, and you re quickly reconfigure the network to block the connection to the criminals' computers. Your quick thinking and sharp skills ensure that millions of people's life savings remain intact. You see, cybersecurity is all about protection. And it's not just about protecting the cyber or computer systems, but it's about protecting people's private information, the things they own, and increasingly, it's about protecting people's safety and well-being. I believe that cybersecurity professionals have the opportunity to be the heroes of the 21st century. This is one of the reasons why I'm so passionate about cybersecurity and why I'm presently working in the field. I am researching ways to protect our nation's critical infrastructure, which is comprised of all the systems, networks, and equipment that are vital to the security and safety of our nation. Many early computer systems or hacking attempts focused on gaining access to systems to obtain services or to simply to show others that access was even possible. A lot of times this was to gain bragging rights. A large part of computer security began by focusing not only on protecting against unauthorized use or denial of use of systems, but also on the protection of the information stored within them. Initially, the protection efforts were driven largely by, um, technologies were driven largely by the government and military then financial institutions, and then finally private industry. And security for personal computers kept pace. Uh, Anti-malware software and firewalls have been available for PCs for over two decades. Now, the protection of information is still one of the most important focuses of cybersecurity today. And it is a difficult job, as we are all well aware as we read about data breaches at major retailers like Target, banks like J.P. Morgan Chase, and government organizations like the Office of Personnel Management. But what about all of this? The US Department of Homeland Security identifies 16 critical infrastructure sectors. Equipment and systems in all these areas are becoming increasingly uh, progressively computerized and interconnected. And I apologize, these were supposed to cycle through. Um, equipment and systems in all these areas are becoming increasingly pro progressively computerized and interconnected, many of them now with connections to the internet. There are computers that control power plant generators, railway systems, chemical facilities, water treatment plants, and many more. 
So now what happens in the cyber world can have an impact on the physical world. Consider how significant this is. What if there was no water when you turned on the faucet because a nearby water treatment plant was hacked? What if your local hospital couldn't treat your injury because cyber attackers have disabled all the medical imaging machines? Think of all the things that would be impossible if the power grid was disabled by cyber attackers. According to the Department of Homeland Security, there were 245 cyber incidents in critical infrastructure sectors reported last year. Foreign governments, criminals, and terrorists are attacking cyber systems in these sectors every day, and the physical consequences are real. Now to illustrate that point, I'm going to show you a very short video that shows what happens when researchers at Idaho National Laboratory simulated a cyber attack on the control system of an electrical generator. The researchers simulated hacking into electric utilities control system and then issued commands from a computer to repeatedly connect and disconnect an electrical generator from the power grid. This was very stressful on the equipment. This experiment was conducted a few years ago and it was very instrumental in creating a lot of awareness um, about the risk of the cyber physical connections uh, in our infrastructure. Hopefully you'll start playing. There we go. So this large green structure is the actual diesel generator, and in a moment you'll see it rock. Every time you see that machine rock, there, um, a researcher is issuing a bad command to its control system from a remote computer. I think it happens two more times here. There you go, you see how you smoke. So as you can see, a few keystrokes on one of the researchers' computers was able to create real world damage. And of course, this is, if this were Hollywood, this would have exploded and people would be running away and flying through the air or anything. But. Now fortunately, there are a lot of people working hard to keep all of our critical infrastructure safe. One of the big challenges um, with securing critical infrastructure systems is that many of their control systems are old and were not designed with cybersecurity in mind. At the time of their installation, it may have been unusual for these kinds of systems to be connected to the internet. Several laboratories and private companies are investigating inserting new technology into these older systems to improve their um, cybersecurity without disturbing the existing equipment. One interesting technique is the deployment of sensors into these networks to monitor for bad data and commands and to prevent them from being acted upon when detected. We are starting to see the products become available called security appliances that can perform, perform this function. And uh, as this simplified graphic shows, the security appliance is essentially inserted between communicating computers, um, and they use what they call deep packet inspection to look at the uh, network communication. They act as traffic cops for the network, and apparently this one is Canadian. The challenge at the moment is how to create the proper rules for the devices and to determine what bad data it looks like and also to be able to apply these rules dynamically in order to keep up with uh, the ever-changing cyber threats. And to do this correctly, it requires the cooperation of many technical professionals, from engineers and technicians who work closely with the security appliance hardware, to networking security specialists, to engineers, operators, and maintenance personnel who are familiar with the equipment being protected. Another area that researchers are focusing on is how to secure the Internet of Things. The Internet of Things refers to smart devices that have sensors and are able to connect to the Internet. Common examples of these are wearables such as Fitbits and Apple Watches, and home energy management devices such as th smart thermostats and smart LED light bulbs. But the Internet of Things is much more than this. These types of devices are now being used in critical infrastructure. And examples include smart electric meters and um, smart traffic lights. The vision, as you can see in this graphic, is to interconnect all the different parts of our world, like our factories, our highways, power grid components, to make things more efficient, effective, and easier to use. The concern is that these devices can be anywhere and everywhere, passing data and commands to many different types of devices. There are now communication pathways that exist just that um, were never conceived of just a few short years ago. For example, um, it may now be possible for a computer virus on an electric utility worker's Fitbit uh, could infect a PC and ultimately end up in the um, utilities control system network and impact an electrical generator. So in this area, researchers are investing in the use of simplified data encryption technologies and network intrusion detection strategies um, that can be implemented on the various devices to combat these risks. In this area, again, you find people with all different skills and backgrounds coming together to solve these issues. As an example, in my group at the lab, I presently work with a chemist, 
a nuclear physicist, a computer scientist, a computer technician, and a mathematician. And I should point out that even occasionally I work with an anthropologist. So I think this area of research also highlights that cyber technology changes rapidly. Many of these Internet of Things devices didn't even exist a few years ago. As all this technology evolves, so must the technology that secures it. And to be successful, you have to keep learning about new devices, techniques, and applications. This fast-paced evolution is one of the things that I feel makes cybersecurity such an exciting field. I hope now that you have a better understanding of cybersecurity and its importance to our nation's critical infrastructure, and perhaps you'll consider it as a career for yourself. President Barack Obama has said that the cyber threat to our nation is one of the most serious economic and national security challenges we face. There is a big need for cybersecurity professionals to protect our critical infrastructure and many possible career paths and employers that you can choose from. And these jobs are open to people with a wide range of educational backgrounds, from a high school degree with a certificate all the way to a PhD. You can work for a private security firm or the IT branch of a private company. You can work for government organizations like the Department of Homeland Security, the NSA, or even a national laboratory. And you can become a cybersecurity soldier. Each of the armed forces now has its own dedicated cybersecurity organization under the direction of the U.S. Cyber Command. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mario. Certainly we're going to need someone like you and others to help protect our gigabit network in Westminster. Our fifth speaker is a principal analyst and group supervisor of the Resources and Affordability Analysis Group at the National Security Analysis Department of Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory. Employed at the laboratory since 1987, his career has included missile and reentry ballistic missile flight analysis, submarine sonar evaluation, countermine and counter chemical biological systems evaluation, unmanned vehicle utility analysis, and combat identification and situational awareness. Since 2009, he has applied his operational analysis and assessment skills to performance improvements and initiatives at several Navy medical hospitals across the United States. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Webb Smith. Thanks. So, um, I also work at the Applied Physics Lab, and uh, I also will not be singing. Um, so, uh, APL is an organization that I love, uh, but uh, this presentation is my own opinion and uh, should not in any way be construed as representing the opinion of the Applied Physics Laboratory. I love APL because it's given me the opportunity to do all kinds of challenging, interesting, and rewarding work. And I'm going to share some of that with you in the context of what was my major? Did it matter? Um, so I'm going to start off by offering some advice. Uh, as I am unqualified to offer advice, you should uh, please take this with a grain of salt. My advice is take advice with a grain of salt. Whether to take someone's advice or not uh, is your responsibility. Uh, but having the discussion and listening to advice can be beneficial, uh, whether that be from parents, friends, uh, teachers, or old guys at podiums. Um, the title of my presentation is Major, 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 because selecting a major is arguably important. Uh, it's at least necessary uh, in order to progress in your education, graduate, and move towards a career or whatever. Um, as I am speaking to STEM, STEM curious people, I can say you are ahead of the curve. Um, what's more important than your specific major uh, is the set of problem solving skills that uh, you develop and hone during your education. Uh, my major was physics. I actually had a high school guidance counselor who suggested looking into engineering. And I honestly didn't know what engineering was, so uh, I knew what physics was because I took physics in high school and it was pretty good and pretty interesting and um, seemed like a good choice and uh, I have to say that I'm very glad that that was my choice. Um, my first resume, by the way, said uh, approximately that I was seeking a position that utilized my physics and mathematics skills. I say approximately because there are no electronic records from that era. Uh, in fact, back in the long, long ago, if you want to change your resume, perhaps to 
um, tailor it to a specific position. You type the whole thing over again on typewriter with hopefully fancy paper. Uh, I didn't do a lot of that, um, by the way. Uh, that's also a terrible objective statement, um, utilizing my physics and mathematics skills. Uh, and I was probably lucky to get an interview, uh, let alone a job. As an aside, they tell me that um, it's no longer recommended to put objective statements in resumes. As a sometimes hiring manager, um, I'm okay with that either way. Uh, what I'm going to look at on someone's resume is, is their major, uh, their GPA, because it's there, uh, and also any internships and research opportunities that, uh, that someone has done. Okay. Anyway, I, job I got, and uh, I was initially a scientific programmer. I am a Fortran expert. That's a very funny statement, uh, but only if you're over 50. Um, <laughs> And I actually was a, a rocket scientist. So, uh, and you can see a few tasks um, that, uh, of a rocket scientist. Um, I was, no lie, the pre-flight designated re-entry flight analyst for this test flight of a submarine launched ballistic missile. Um, that was in 1987. Um, this flight had an expected range of a few thousand miles and uh, a missed distance of a few hundred yards. Um, you can see my analysis. Um, and uh, that's sort of not actually rocket science. Um, anyway, I, uh, I transitioned into sonar uh, for a while, serving at the Navy Submarine Development Squadron 12 in Groton, Connecticut. Um, this was about incorporating technical findings from at sea submarine on submarine exercises uh, into tactical guidance. Uh, being underwater on a sub for a you know, couple of weeks is uh, you know, no vacation. Uh, it's sort of like uh, running a marathon. It's not really fun uh, while you're doing it, but after it's over, you're, you're happy you did it. I can't really tell you anymore, or I'd have to shoot you. OK. Um, but this somehow led me into uh, further test and evaluation, operational assessment efforts. For a number of years, I uh, supported the Advanced Concept Technology Demonstration Program. Um, this was about assessing the potential utility of new technologies uh, in a simulated combat environment. Uh, some examples include chem bio defense, uh, mine detection and clearance, um, friend or foe identification technologies, um, and I also took a lot of pictures and got my picture taken. Um, anyway, these tasks required uh, the application of what we could call Operational Assessment 101. Uh, the simple concept, does it work? Is it suitable? Does it favorably and measurably uh, impact the uh, military mission? What is required here is the ability to identify and sometimes uh, define or create uh, key metrics what is really important for a given uh, combat mission, uh, and how to actually measure that uh, in an exercise environment, combining both uh, quantitative, ana quantitative analysis and subject matter expertise. Um, what's the point of all this? Um, unless you remain in academia, which is fine, but not me, uh, your major is not a limiting factor in what you do. Uh, it's about digging in and solving problems uh, working with others, because none of this can be done alone. Uh, being flexible, seeing opportunities, and always striving to do good analysis. My major was physics, but it could have been systems engineering, computer science, operations research, mathematics, aeronautical engineering, about a dozen more STEM majors. Uh, by the way, advice alert, uh, do not neglect writing and communication skills. Uh, as I've said, as a STEM major, uh, you're probably ahead of the curve. Uh, if you can do good analysis and present that and write it uh, un down understandably, you are uh, riding the bow wave. While your specific major may not be that important, uh, it could impact the rest of your life. But my advice, again, uh, is to find something that uh, just interests you, you find compelling, maybe uh, it's challenging to you, and maybe it's just really cool. Um, oop. I seem to have missed some slides. So, um, uh, for the past few years, I've been working in performance improvement in uh, military healthcare. Uh, this is uh, 
somewhat of a career change for me, uh, perhaps less technical, uh, definitely fewer weapons. Uh, but it still requires the skills from my education, my career experience, uh, and adding a few more skills too. Uh, in other words, I'm still learning. And so what is performance improvement? Well, a simple example, uh, a nurse's value is in direct patient care. Uh, we can all agree on that. Uh, he, and he or she should logically uh, not be restocking supply closets. Uh, that's a job for supply staff. Uh, but you can't just say that. Uh, you have to set up processes and systems such that it's easy to know how much of what supplies must be ordered and delivered uh, based on consumption and ensure that the uh, replenishment process is reliable enough for the nurse to absolutely trust it. A more analytically challenging example is accessing data from multiple electronic sources uh, to identify patients who are at risk for hospital-acquired infections, um, such that steps can be taken to prevent, mitigate, or minimize adverse outcomes, that is, uh, improve patient care. So now I'm a neophyte industrial engineer, uh, although we actually have teams of real industrial engineers uh, doing this work across uh, uh, Navy hospitals across the country. Um, so um, uh, just to leave you with a, a disclaimer, I never was a combat engineer, never actually been in combat. Um, I do think that uh, I've, um, help to uh, provide um, some value to uh, soldiers and Marines and airmen um, and uh, uh, sailors. Um, and uh, I guess my final piece of advice is uh, do well, do good, and have fun. So, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Smith. I'm sure they'll take that advice with a grain of salt. Our sixth and final speaker is a former Carroll Community College student who is here to share her story and to inspire all of you that no matter how high your academic STEM goals are, you can achieve them. Please join me in welcoming Ms. Amanda Corbel. Does that work? Oh, it does work. Perfect. Okay, so I want to start off by asking you guys a question. And for the high school students, how many of you guys know exactly what you want to do when you graduate? Okay, so a couple of you. So everyone that didn't raise your hand, that's where I was when I was in your shoes. I always had a passion for science, but I strayed away from it because I never believed I was smart enough. So when I began college here, I took general courses, I worked, and just kind of coasted along. And it wasn't until my second year here that I started to come back towards my passion of science. Okay, so uh, like I said, it was my second year here and um, I learned about the Smart Scholars Program, which is a research course they offer here at the college. And I didn't think I'd be selected, but I still applied and I was hopeful when I was. And it was during that time that I started to realize, hey, maybe I could be good at this, maybe I'm smart enough to do this. So I spent time here doing the research course. I joined the STEM club, which is a, a group on campus interested in STEM, and I was the treasurer of that. And I graduated in 2013 with my associate's degree. And the summer before I started at my four-year um, university, I worked as an intern at the National Cancer Institute. And the only reason I came across this opportunity was because of the Smart Scholars Program. And my first summer, I worked in the target biology group at the advanced, ooh, at the Advanced Technology Research Facility, which is one of the NTI's facilities, just off base. Then I decided to transfer to Shepherd University, which is where I got my four-year degree in biochemistry. And while I was there, I started um, to get more confident, but I still wasn't as confident as I should have been. I still always had this fear that I was never going to be smart enough to actually be successful in this field. After my first year there, I um, applied for another internship at the National Cancer Institute, and this time in another lab, the AIDS and Cancer Virus Program. And I worked there for my summer for three months, and then I came back for my winter break. And I will let you guys know that the internships at the NCI are paid, and I did earn six college credits, which is a big deal to have six credits. It really helps your GPA. And I'm actually really happy to announce that I'll have my first official publication in a scientific journal from the work I did there. Uh, coming up soon. It takes a while to get things rolling, but it should be in the Journal of Virology, so I'm really excited about that. So when I graduated from Shepherd, I got my degree in biochem, and 
I was kind of at this point, what do I want to do next? I know I like science, I know I like medicine, but what exactly do I want to do? I was interested in neuro-oncology, which is studying brain cancer, but there's so many different things that I could do to get to my end goal. So which path is best for me? I wasn't really sure. So I took another internship at the NCI, and this time it was with the Division of Cancer, Genetics, and Epidemiology, specifically within the immune infections and immunoepidemiology branch. And after having a successful summer there, they invited me to come back and do a post back. And when I tell people I'm a post back, they're like, what is that? I don't really understand. And basically, it's for people like me that aren't really sure what they want to do next, so it just gives them that time so you can work on things during that time and be successful. So currently, I'm a post back at um, the NCI, and um, I will have a publication for that work as well, which I'm really excited about. So right now, I'm where the question mark is, and I have my end goal over here, which is neuro-oncology. And as you can see by the little diagram I made, there's a lot of different paths I can take to get there. And I have decided finally, after a lot of consideration and a lot of sleepless nights, that I want to go to medical school and also maybe get my PhD. So I'm currently in the process of applying to medical school, which any of you that want to go to medical school, it's really expensive to just apply. So good luck with that. Um, so I'm applying to medical school, and I'll hopefully start interviewing soon and then be on my way. And I just kind of want to leave you guys with a little piece of advice. Again, you don't have to take it. But if any of you are like me and have always kind of doubted yourself and I don't know if I'm smart enough, don't. One of my advisors at the NCI told me something, and it's always stuck with me since he told it to me, and that was there's always going to be people out there that are smarter than you, and it's not in your control, so don't worry about that. Worry about what you can control. What you can control is how much work you put in. No one can outwork you if you don't let them. If you fall, get back up. Keep going until you reach your goal, and you will be successful. You just have to keep working. So that's my advice, and good luck to you guys. Thanks. Thank you, Amanda. Um, let's give one more big round of applause to all of our panelists for their great work and sharing. Um, I want to acknowledge quickly um, some people that were very integral in making today happen um, from Carroll Community College and really the workhorse behind this entire event is Dr. Raza Khan, uh, as well as Professor Maria Burness. I'd also like to thank uh, the, the administration in their entirety here and all the people from behind the scenes that have helped out um, and, and so on and so forth. We're a little time constrained, so I'm gonna jump ahead and we're gonna move to our question and answer period. For those of you in the audience live, there are two microphones in the front here. We'd love for you just to come down and ask your questions. Um, for your risk taking that Dr. Wack talked about, there's a small token of a lanyard there you can take with you for coming forth. For those of you watching streaming on channel 18 or 21, there is uh, an address there, um, padlet.com um, backslash ccps stem backslash QA for our question and answer or a QR code that can launch you in, and we will be able to get some, some um, streaming messages or questions from people out there watching. So we're excited. Um, for those of you who hopefully have been formulating questions, please come on down. We'll bring up and see what questions hopefully people can get in there quickly. Again, that was padlet.com backslash ccps stem backslash QA. We're looking for risk takers, so while our risk takers are making their way down, don't be shy, uh, it looks like someone has already chimed in. Stacy had a question on what kind of security clearance do you need to have to be a cybersecurity specialist, and how does one go about security questions? So this is not specifically directed to anyone, um, but Joe, you can maybe start. Sure. Um, is it okay to remain seated? Please. Do you want me to yep. stand? Or? Okay. Your choice. <laughs> okay. Uh, that's an excellent question. Uh, typically, um, maybe you can back me up on this too, the security clearances are, um, you have to be, uh, someone has to sponsor you for security clearance um, for a particular uh, position or job. Is that correct statement? Yeah. And then the, uh, the clearance level you would need would actually depend on the job or the sponsor of the work, or um, it could even be uh, where you do work. So um, not to give you a uh, somewhat generic answer, but it does, it does vary with the position you're seeking. Uh, there's a good website that I would refer you to. The um, uh, Department of Homeland Security has a website. It's the National um, Initiative for Cybersecurity Careers and 
can't remember the last one, it's NICCS, if you Google that and, and Department of Homeland Security, uh, there's a lot of good information about the kinds of certifications and clearances and jobs that are available, um, both for private industry, the government, and the military. Anyone else? Um, just uh, when you get a security clearance, they ask lots of questions, and it matters what you've done in your life. So as you're moving through the fun part of teenage years, keep that in mind. If that's something you want to do, you want to get a security clearance, the decisions you make at 2 in the morning on a Friday or uh, down in Ocean City may come back to haunt you when you go for a security clearance. Keep that in mind. Mr. Smith? I'm going to disagree with that slightly. <laughs> <laughs> so. What's more important about what you've done in your life when you're doing security clearance forms is to be fully honest, full disclosure. Um, that's more important than any transgressions that one might have done while... Well, I'm being a dad. Yeah. <laughs> Listen to him <laughs> and his advice. Thank you. We've got some people already here. Let's take a question. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's a big one. And, uh, it, it, it's a big one because actually it's, it's the future that you will have to deal with. And, that's, uh, uh, and, and it will affect us all, but it certainly will affect you more than anybody else. And, uh, and there is one thing that, uh, that we can tell with some degree of certainty, and is that it's not going to look like now. Uh, now, the question then is how do you prepare yourself for something that you don't know exactly how it's going to look like? Uh, there are a few guidance, simple guidances, that you can take with uh, grains of salt, as uh, <laughs> just quoting the, the, the advice. Um, prepare to work on teams. It's unavoidable, because all the fields are growing very large and very deep at the same time. And uh, so there are many ways to, uh, uh, to approach a given subject. If nano is, uh, is, is, is of interest to you, uh, it's a multidimensional thing, as all the fields will become. So um, you can actually choose the side from which you're going to approach it, but uh, believe me, at the time when you finally get to the point that you're going to be working with the subject, you're going to be part of the team. Uh, so that's a skill that you need to develop early on. Uh, and, uh, and as I said, uh, learning to abstract information, no matter what you do, is going to be valuable. Uh, because we're going to get a lot of pre-processed information, no matter what we do, uh, a computer may actually uh, prepare some of the information for us, but we may, uh, we, we may have to be able to connect the dots, and, uh, and that requires some, some basic skills that, uh, in my opinion, you will benefit from math, even if you're not going to be using math later on. It's the way your brain gets trained. Well, just to add a couple of points there, uh, so I think uh, you know, biological sciences in general is, is an area of growth. Um, I also think that you know one of the biggest challenges facing us is climate change. Um, so not so much can we prevent it; it's coming. But how do we react to that? So you know, obviously that impacts infrastructure, agriculture, um, you know, coastal lives, and things like that. So those are, those are the things that I think would be, you know, if of interest um, to uh, look into. So and one other thing to add to that, I got to put in a plug for the humanities. Uh, so even though you guys are STEM people, don't stop taking English courses, history courses, psychology courses, because at the end of the day, all of these technologies sooner or later interface with humans and human organizations and, and towns and societies, and you have to understand humans, and the best way to understand humans is the humanities, literature, history, sociology. So. Keep, keep taking those classes, keep following those kinds of interests too, because you have to have a, the technology has to be grounded in human stuff. Thanks for being a risk taker and getting things started. Take a few lanyards and we're gonna jump right over here to another question. Um, my question is for any of you that were in the military, how did that help further your career? It, it may have <laughs> appeared that I was in the military, but I was not. Um, I was in the military, and I'll tell you, it was a great experience. 
but all of my colleagues in the military didn't necessarily have great experiences, but sometimes bad experiences help you also. Um, but it's teamwork, being part of a large organization, learning how to work inside a bureaucracy, certainly serving your country is very, very important. Um, they paid for medical school, which is a pretty sweet deal. Um, so it was a big help. Thank you. Great, we got them lined up, so let's take another one here and then we'll jump to an online question, please. Oh, actually, sir, you're there first, thanks. All right. Um, for a, uh, for like a computer science major, how would you get into the, like, the, like counter-terrorism type of deal? Like, um, like, where would you start out? I don't know who to ask. Yeah, that's an excellent question. Um, <laughs> you want no, no, I was pointing at you. Again, not to, not to lean on that, that website I mentioned before, uh, there, it's a good starting point, it's the NICCS website. Uh, it does give a good overview of the different possible career opportunities that are out there and how, you know, what credentials you need. Um, as far as anti-terrorism, um, it, it really depends um, what your, I guess your interests are. I mean, so, so the field is very large. I mean, there's people who focus uh, strictly on defense. Um, there's people who do penetration testing, which is like the, you know, like the traditional people think the, the hacking kind of things. Um, there's people who uh, approach it, there's system engineers who look at uh, tackling the problem at large. Um, I'd say if you're interested in more in the anti-terrorism, I would consider some of the um, government organizations uh, like the NSA perhaps. Um, let's see who else would be in that one. Um, FBI. Um, CIA. CIA. FBI. Yeah. Hey, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. We'll, we'll take one uh, from, from our online submissions, um, possibly for our two uh, primary presenters. Can nanomachinery be used to create a simulated immune system for someone with an immune deficiency or immune system problem? Wow. Um, I strong maybe. Um, no, that's the joke. The problem with nano is that uh, for all its uh, potential, it is still in its infancy. Uh, when you're talking about uh, a synthetic immune system, you're talking about complexity, something that will not just simply provide a response, but will integrate with a number of feedback mechanisms that, is, that the, uh, the biological systems uh, present. So uh, my sense is that we may someday uh, move in that direction. Right now, there are low-hanging fruits that are a lot simpler to develop. Um, for instance, you can think about uh, ways in which you can move a drug to a specific site, adding uh, potency and lowering side effects that uh, may be used <coughs> to evaluate and to learn, to evaluate the risks of these materials. And the more we learn about these materials, the more we will be able to dream with new applications. But jumping to the end goal without knowing what the risks are uh, may be a little bit premature. That's why we need to go through this process. We need to go through this learning process, and we need to look at this from all possible sides so that we can uh, get to some of those end goals, including maybe someday artificial uh, antibodies. I have a quick statement I want to make about that. So one of the things that we can do with biology and biological systems in a way that could eventually sort of reduce the number of animals that we're using in studies is something that we call 3D modeling of uh, structures. So we can sort of simulate an organ by growing different cell types together in a 3D uh, sort of way. And then we can stress that system with different outside interferences and look at the modeling. And this is something that's sort of referred to as systems biology where you have a model and you look at how it responds to a injury per se, whether it's disease or cancer, and then you look at how that re model responds in its DNA and its RNA and its protein level and its metabolites level. And then here's where the bioinformatics comes into systems biology. We look at that system and we model its responses. And then we create algorithms that will model the response to an organ to an injury. So some of the um, things that I see hap happening in the future are systems biology modeling where computers and science come together to predict disease outcomes. Great question. Obviously we could spend hours on some of these questions so they're fantastic. Let's jump to another one here please. I've been wondering uh, what 
major would I want to go for if I was to be a forensic scientist? A forensic scientist? So um, I would pick a biology major, but you might want to go into a microbiology major or a major where um, uh, molecular genetics was a very um, specific uh, uh, strength. So in other words, for forensic techniques, um, you, could, you could focus on the DNA and the RNA, which they're looking at um, you know, the crime scene. But also physical evidence involves looking at explosives, so that could be some mass spectrometry is used in airports to look at you know, explosives on people's fingers or their suitcases. Um, but I okay. kind of tend to think a biological science may be better if you were interested in forensic science as it relates to a crime scene investigation per se. <laughs> so. Um, yeah. may, may I add one general comment? Uh, there is something that is very difficult for us uh, to convey to you, and is uh, the physicality of the experience. Um, when we talk about our subjects, we talk about things that we are doing in a certain manner, in a certain space. Um, some of the work, and, uh, and, and forensics can be something that you can perform at the field level, um, or you can be working entirely with computers, just analyzing data. Uh, now, the two experiences actually intersect, but they're not identical. And there is a physicality to it that is non-transferable, because it has to do with your fingerprint interacting <coughs> with a particular place. So one strong recommendation is do internships experience the environment. Try to go to the places and see what happened and see if you feel comfortable. And it goes for lab environments. Do you tolerate the hours and hours of standing next to the bench? Your feet will hurt. But you can draw pleasure out of the experience. Or uh, you prefer to work sitting at the computer, uh, but other parts of your body will hurt after a while because you're sitting all the time. And uh, so there is a physicality to the experience that you need to acquire and it's not transferable. It depends critically in your intention to actually go to the places and experience the space, the smells, the sounds, what really happens. It will, re it will enrich your experience, but it, it will also <coughs> may uh, tilt a little bit your decision in one direction or another. That is great advice. I hated lab work. I love it. <laughs> I could sit there all day. It, it, all yeah. So that's great advice. So for those of you that are here, uh, one announcement. We do have a representative from the National Cancer Institute present uh, who will be willing to uh, stick around and answer some questions regarding internships. Uh, we are up against um, an early dismissal day. So for the people who haven't gotten their question asked yet, we are going to document those. For those of you submitting online that we haven't gotten to and put together some documentation, which we'll probably post on the CCPS STEM website uh, and very likely see if we can do that as well through the Carroll Community website. So please don't disappear. But I do need to bring um, um, Dr. Ball for it again, who has a very special announcement. I, I want to take a moment to say for all the students that are here and, we, and those that are watching us uh, from the online environment, that we are very excited at this point to be able to announce a special STEM program that, that would be integrating all the different STEM majors around a, a specific uh, program we're calling the STEM Scholars Program. This, this STEM Scholars Program will be cohort based. It will be uh, a cohort that you join and interact through your time at Carroll Community College, working on your associate's degree, preparing to transfer to the baccalaureate degree, and its goal is to produce the next generation of graduate students and STEM workers. Our STEM Scholars Program is going to be addressing the, the major gap that exists between uh, the need for STEM professionals and STEM jobs and, and the supply. And our goal is to simulate a work experience because work environments these days are often interdisciplinary. You're working with many different people in the, from different disciplines. You are working in teams. You're often working with people from across the globe on, on uh, projects and so on. And that collaborative nature of working and learning is an important element. So we're building that into our STEM Scholars program. Cohort students are going to be learn, learning through creation of authentic research as, as you go through this program. 
And that's going to be grounded in collaborative and interdisciplinary learning activities, uh, existing research, and exposure to people and individuals in the environments in which you might want to work. STEM scholars are going to perform problem-based projects, uh, work on the latest research, uh, and work to continue that research, perhaps, towards their baccalaureate and graduate degree studies. We'll also focus heavily on career preparation, pathways into specific STEM careers. A lot of the questions that you were asking today are about how do we enter the world of, of STEM, how do we get clearances, how do we, we get some form of introduction into that world. And so the program will focus a great deal on putting you in touch with mentors and people who can help you develop career-wise as you move along your program. The benefit of a small group problem-based learning uh, uh, approach is that you develop tight bonds with one another and those bonds will continue past Carroll Community College often well into your, your uh, career as a STEM professional. So our goal is to, to develop that bond and develop the professionals that will be serving us in the future. We're launching this now because we, and we've been in development of the aspects of this program for quite a while. As our concepts have developed, we've received funds from a, several donors, but in particular, uh, it was a generous con contribution from the Callert Foundation that enabled us to kind of move forward on this program. The Kellert Foundation is a Carroll County-based philanthropic organization, but they have a wide impact around the county and, else, and throughout the nation, actually. They have a very strong commitment to investing in the community that has high impact and will serve the public in lasting ways. And their recent gifts to us have enabled us to accelerate our program launch and help students in supporting scholarships and supporting our STEM scholars research based approach to the uh, program to supporting state of the art equipment in, pro in the program and any uh, additional supports that need to be developed. That support along with our dedicated faculty and if you haven't gotten the sense that this, the, the Carroll Community College science faculty are amazing, um, you know, you're missing something out on today. They, they are an amazing group of folks. They work on behalf of students so diligently, I can't believe it. These folks often never sleep. And they are, they are truly uh, the foundation and the rock for getting this, this program started. So we thank Mr. Greg Callert and the Callert Foundation for their continued support of the college and for our students and uh, invite you to look into applying to this program. It will begin in the fall of 2016. We're looking for a cohort of about 20 students, and that could be from our existing student base or from entering students. <clears throat> the application information will be available very quickly and on a website on our webpage at the college by December 1st. We'll be looking to make admissions decisions in February for that program. So if you have questions, we will be having uh, an event here on campus tomorrow that, that is a STEM event. We're going to be highlighting our programs. Our faculty will be here. Please come and engage with our faculty about what goes on in STEM here at the college and particularly about that program. And we also have additional on-campus events planned for next week in support of De STEM Day. November 11th in the Great Hall will be also a lot of hands-on activities for students who want to learn about STEM. And our own Professor Wizard will be talk, talking and doing his presentation of, about the wonders of science. Some of you may have seen him in the past. So I just want to thank you for being here today. Thank you for allowing this announcement. I encourage you to look into our new STEM Scholars Program, cohort-based program that is going to be exceptional for a group of students who really want to interact in the way the world will be uh, making you act as future employees in STEM. So thank you, I appreciate that. And with that, I turn it, Brian, back over to you. Thank you.
Thank you, Dr. Ball. That's the most exciting announcement, and I'm sure the people in the audience that have been here today are excited and possibly mulling that as a possibility as one way to launch their career. Um, this will officially conclude the formal part of our presentation today. We will work to, to move around and gather those questions, and of course, you, you also might submit that online if you don't get to talk to someone personally and have your questions submitted so we can accrue those answers for you. A reminder that there's a National Cancer Institute member here, uh, seated to the left if you wouldn't mind standing so the students can um, seek her out if you have questions regarding internships. Uh, and other opportunities uh, that Ms. Corbel spoke about. Uh, I'm sure our panelists aren't exactly sprinting out the door, so if you have a second and you have a question, you might be able to catch them real quick on a one-on-one -on -one basis. Thank you for attending. I think this has been a fantastic day. Thank you to Carroll Community College. Thank you to these professionals who have taken time out of their obviously very busy careers to be here with us today. And thank you, audience, for your participation.